Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to sunny Oxford. Thank you so much for joining us here on our first Oxford Strategic Leadership Programme. Um, this is how do the best leaders use management knowledge and research to introduce change. And we're hosted today by uh, Sue Dobson, our Faculty Dean, also a tutor on the Oxford Strategic Leadership Programme. Um, my name is Gemma, I work in the marketing team here and I'll be talking you through the housekeeping and how the webinar will work today. And then I pass to my colleague, Shing, who's the Associate Director for the Open Programmes and for this particular programme. And then on to Sue to run the webinar. And we're also, I'm very excited to say, we're joined by two alumni panellists today who have been on our programme in the recent um, year, which is Kevin Higgins, the Senior Vice President of the CBRE in the United States, and Laura Tooley, the Quality of Quality Improvement Programme Lead for the NHS in the UK. So a really nice international mix and they're very excited about sharing their perspectives and thoughts with you today. Uh, we will then go on to Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can type in your questions on the right hand side of your panel. You'll see a section where you can write in your questions and I'll field them at the end of the webinar. The only time that you can ask questions midway through is um, John Stokes, who's a Associate Fellow of the school, who also teaches on the programme and is a tutor for the programme, will be giving a session at 10 to 3, around about 10 to 3, and John can then take questions from that session at about 3 o'clock before we then move on to the alumni panel. Um, so there will be an opportunity for you to ask specific questions about that particular part of the actual webinar. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Shing um, for further details on the programme. Thank you. So thank you very much, Gemma, and welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our alumni um, across the school, but also alumni um, uh, of the Strategic Leadership Programme. Um, thank you very much for supporting us. To those of you that I know that you've shown an interest in the programme already, um, to participants that we know are confirmed to come on the programme in May, and to all of you who are interested in leadership development and this programme in particular, um, welcome. The Oxford Strategic Leadership Programme is a flagship programme of the school. Um, we are now very fortunate to be in the 33rd year of running this programme. Our next programme actually commences the, from the 17th to the 22nd of May, taking place in Oxford. We do still have some final places remaining, so if you are interested um, post this webinar, then please do get in touch. We'd be delighted to, to work with you. Participants um, join us, as Gemma said, from all over the world. We are very lucky um, that Oxford and this programme in particular has a real convening power um, from senior leaders all over the world. Um, for example, in May, we already have leaders confirmed um, from all corners of the globe, um, including uh, managing directors of banks, um, chairman of family firms, senior directors, um, and again, arranging from all the, the private sector um, to the not-for-profit sector, NGOs and charities. So we're really delighted um, that should you wish to join us, you'll be in great company. Thank you, Shane. That's fantastic. I'm just going to pass over now to Professor Sue Dobson, who's going to be hosting the webinar today. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's my job, really, to um, talk about um, some of the research that goes on in Oxford that the programme directly draws upon. And in a sense, um, the research that we do uh, within the business school is really looking at uh, the really big issues, big problems um, of, uh, in society that leaders need to worry about. So in a sense, um, the research that we draw on specifically this, from this programme draws from the Smith School, which uh, does some really interesting research on climate change and long-term sustainability. The Ox and Martin School, uh, which is really there to foster innovative thinking and interdisciplinary scholarship to work on the pressing problems and new opportunities in the 21st century. And also the Department of Psychology, in particular the program works with Charles Spence, who his research, which is very leading edge, looks at how people perceive the world around them and how, in a sense, our brains manage to process information from our different senses. So you begin to be see that um, the program draws not just on research within the business school, but also within the wider university. And in particular, the session that showcases um, some of that 
worry about the future is really Ian Golding's session where participants are taken through I think a whole range of surprising challenges about the future and essentially that is to provoke our participants to think about their own future challenges. Are they working on the challenges that are going to matter in the future? And I think it's fair to say that that session in itself causes uh, the leaders in the room to really reflect on how they are spending their time. Um, if we move to the research that we specifically have done in the business school, which is on you know, what are the kinds of challenges that are facing leaders uh, in the future? And in a way, how do they learn? How do they um, use management knowledge? This kind of um, set of questions really um, is the basis for a lot of the briefing of speakers and a lot of the way we've designed the program. So let me just give you uh, some themes that have emerged um, from that kind of work. In particular, I'm drawing on work that looks at how leaders learn. And a more recent study that's done by colleagues within the business school on us, what are the chief executives really uh, thinking about what are their challenges and, 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 and what are their strategic leadership problems. So if we look um, about how what we know from this research about what causes leaders to seek management knowledge, then in a sense there's a very um, strong theme around uh, people really looking at a puzzle, yeah, something, a puzzle uh, that they become intrigued about, that they know is important, that causes them to think, uh, to think what is out there that I can use to try and solve this, this puzzle. And uh, in a way, people are filtering knowledge uh, that we produce in business schools for pragmatic value. And so again, when we're designing the program, we're thinking very much about drawing on that insight. You know, what are the puzzles that people bring to the program? Um, what are the, you know, the, the, the kind of very useful, pragmatic sense of knowledge that people can uh, throw in there that they can explore? Um, and in a way, what we've also found is that it's very important to understand where you come from as a leader. In other words, your past experiences. Um, and we talk about crucible moments really, um, really influencing the way in which people, uh, leaders uh, lead uh, and manage change. So again, within the program, there's a lot of emphasis on individuals looking at where they have come from, what has made them a leader, um, and what were those crucible moments that really have begun to shape their own leadership work. Um, Gareth Morgan session in particular, uh, again, looks at those kinds of insights, takes those insights and begins to uh, provoke individuals to think about, well, what are the earthquakes, if you like, that are coming down the hill in terms of their leadership work? Uh, and what are the complexity? And I think it's all around this idea about adaptive leadership, that in today's very complex environments, leaders simply have to be uh, adaptive. If I turn now to uh, thinking about the CEO research that we've just completed, um, this was a, well, in a sense, give you all the details about the methodology, but a, a, a really extensive interview-based survey with, with, with leading uh, organizations. And the key issue here, or the key findings here, is that the success of a CEO today hinges on continual growth in their role even more than on the preparation beforehand. And in a, in a way, anticipating how, when, and why different contexts interact to disrupt an organization requires the development of what my colleagues have called ripple intelligence, an almost an early warning system. So leaders really need to build a, uh, an intelligence system which feeds them so they become aware um, of what is going on in the context of which they are a part. And ripple intelligence um, gets sharpened as leaders learn to harness the power of doubt. And leaders who embrace doubt as a positive state that is both emotional and intellectual are able to select different strategies to mobilize, even outsource their doubts in service of better decisions. And these skills are very important uh, in an environment where chasing certainty is often futile. 
being adaptable and authentic is an, a leadership paradox that, that pops up in this research that CEOs have to embrace. And again, I would say that's something that we very much in the program uh, encourage our participants to explore, this challenge of being adaptable and authentic. Now, I've very briefly um, given you um, the, some of the headlines about um, you know, what we're discovering about the challenges of leading in a very complex, uncertain environment. Um, and the, the, one of the key features of the program are, is the use of tutor groups. Very simply, this is a small group opportunity, um, four or five people typically in a, a group, um, who embrace conversations about their own leadership, are able to explore and, and explore doubt, their doubts, together in a very safe way. Um, this is part of the Oxford approach. Tutor, tutoring, as you know, has been uh, is part of the, the way in which students learn in Oxford. And we're learning with each other through asking questions and exploring our different contexts and our challenges. These groups occur almost daily in the program. And they're also uh, spaces to make sense of some of the material uh, on leadership that, it, that is, is taught rather more formally in the class. So in brief, the design of the program very much draws on our increasing understanding of what leaders do, what, what are the challenges of, of, of leadership. It increasingly draws on the wider university research, particularly on future, what are the future challenges in the 21st century, what are the big issues, what are the big problems. Um, we, we encourage people to look at what are the changing rules of the game, um, what are the new strategies that they might bring in to cope with that uh, in a very supportive way. It's, it's really a case in the tutor groups of, of leaders learning together. And I think it's fair to say that, that that is the space where a lot of the surprises occur and a lot of real development and growth occurs as well. What I'd like now to do uh, is really to um, move on and um, ask John, my colleague, uh, who's a fellow tutor on the program, John Stokes, what challenges do leaders really bring to the program, John? Hello? Hello, John, can you hear us? Hello, John? Sounds like we might have a, a, a bit of a... Hello, can you oh, hear hello. me? Hello, John. Can you hear me now? We can now, we had a... Yes, like hello. Oh, hello. So let me say that again. Uh, John, um, what, what, what challenges do leaders bring to the programme, uh, what would you say? Well, I think by far the biggest and most common one is not so much the creation of, of, of a good enough strategy, which is actually relatively easier, than the problem, and this is the problem they are often bringing, is how do I implement this strategy? We know from research that um, something like 70% of strategies are poorly or, or, or not at all implemented. And, of course, the reason for this is not because they're not clever strategies, but because of the human factor, we could call it, in leadership, uh, of which this uh, program focuses greatly. That the problem for a leader is really how to get communication with people, how to get commitment, uh, and how to influence and persuade. All the research on leadership, from a psychological perspective at least, uh, has really shown that there is no such thing, despite the human wish that there be, there is no such thing as a common factor across all leaders. Uh, when you think about it for a bit, this isn't surprising because leadership is, is, is much more a quality of the relationship between a leader and their followers. And in fact, is, 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 a, is a quality of three components. It's the leader, the followers, and the context. Uh, this is not something that leaders often pay a lot of attention to, and coming on the program is really an opportunity to, to take a step off what I call the, the safe comfort zone island of management, which is, which is essentially the um, attainment of certainty, of predictability, of things happening on time, all very valuable qualities, of course, but if you're doing that, you're not doing leadership, is what I say. You're not in the swampy ground of leadership, of 
of, of embracing doubt, as Sue has been talking about, uh, about the uncertainty, about the future, essentially. Fu leadership is, in simple terms, future-focused and unknown, uncertainty-focused, and therefore a different activity from management. In terms of research, uh, we also know that by far the biggest factor is how you're perceived as a leader, and this is something that you can't know yourself. You have to get feedback, and during the course of the week, there are opportunities for getting feedback about how you're perceived by new colleagues in a new situation, uh, but uh, often very accurate perceptions because you're, you're spending time with them. And the whole question of, of influence, how to influence and how to persuade, how you are perceived, what your image is, and how many people you know. Another point from research is that one of the best predictors of, of young people who are going to be effective leaders in the future is their ability to create relationships with a wide range of people, the ability to create uh, relationships with a wide range of people as judged by your peers. This is, is one of the strongest single research-based predictors of who are going to become leader, which is just to make the point that this is about relationship. Um, it's not about a course which provides you with a solution to the problem. It's a course in Oxford style, as Sue has explained, that gets you to ask really deep questions and penetrating questions about who am I as a leader, how am I perceived, how could I be more effective as a leader, how can I build effective leadership relationships, and as such we, we create a safe environment, the tutor group, and indeed the program as a whole, where you can explore these questions. We, as I say, don't have a, a, a model of leadership that we're trying to promote. Many business schools, that's, that's the operating model. It's, it's far more about discovering the right model of leadership for you, based on your personality and your situation, and indeed your followers. So this is, uh, those of you looking at the slides will see the chief emotional officer is a, is, a, is a way I like, you know, what does a CEO do? Chief emotional officer, it's not executive, that's in many ways a reference to management, in fact. It's, it's the chief emotional officer in the sense that the task of leadership is to, one could say, is in large part anyway, to manage the emotional life of the organization. Since an organization with good morale, with clear commitment, with good communication, with a good sense of collaboration, those are all essentially relationships, and it's through the way in which the leader or leaders at the top of an organization uh, demonstrate their capacity for those relationships, and that's how in human groups, in hierarchies, people learn, is they learn by observation. And so it's the actual behavior of yourself as a leader that, that, that matters. Say there that culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's a, a phrase which really means, well, all the best strategies in the world are useless on Monday morning because uh, by the end of breakfast, it's going to be about the culture in the organization. That's what's going to determine whether your strategy is created. Hence, it's, it's relationships that are so important. So our view is you can't teach leadership, and we don't have a model of leadership for you other than the research-based model of leadership, which says it's about relationships. It's about context, it's about how you communicate, it's about the model of leadership that is right for you and your personality and your followers. just wanted to add a final comment uh, here about one of the exercises which we do, which Sue referred to, which we call the crucible exercise. If you research leaders and ask them, well, where did you learn most about leadership? Uh, sadly for us, they don't say at a business school. Uh, where they say they learn most about leadership is from three things. Challenging assignments that they had early on in their career, so assignments where they were sent abroad into a difficult situation, whatever. Somebody gave you, in a sense, the opportunity to do something difficult, and if you don't have that experience, it's more difficult to learn about leadership. So being given that difficult assignment, in other words, taking up responsibility at an early age for a difficult situation. Having a personal mentor is the second one, somebody who is interested, took an interest in your development. That's the second factor that uh, senior leaders talk about as important in the background. And the third is uh, learning from adversity, that adverse things happen to all of us at different points in our life, whether at work or at home. Now we can either learn from those things or we can not learn from those experiences. And they, what the leaders say is it's, it's learning from those experiences because all of this really amounts to experiences that force you to take responsibility or you choose to take up responsibility. 
uh, and that's really how you learn to be a leader. And so we have a crucible event in which we ask people to think about some of the events in their life and how they've influenced them as human beings, some of the more difficult events in their lives, ones they're prepared to talk about, and how these are, uh, how these have influenced their development as leaders. So as you can see, it's the most in interesting and enjoyable program for us as tutors <laughs> to, to work on. Uh, we learn as much about ourselves, and certainly I learn as much about leadership every time I'm a tutor on this program, as I'm sure the participants do, who incidentally also learn a huge amount from each other, as I said, through feedback and through hearing the stories and struggles that their colleagues have uh, been through. I think that's all. I'll stop at that point. Okay, so, 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 so John, um, we, we've invited people to, to obviously ask questions as we go along, but maybe I can kick off, and, and I, I, you and I are both tutors on the program, and it, I, I mentioned uh, some of the important role that those tutor group exercises play in the program in terms of integrating knowledge and helping people make sense of it. Were there any additional points that you felt you wanted to make on the, on the tutor group uh, a contribution to process of people exploring leadership, exploring what knowledge they need, um, what knowledge will help them in their change work? I think we all take the same approach, which is that we encourage people at the beginning to identify, if you like, their leadership challenges, what are real situations which they're currently faced with as leaders, to identify those first of all, uh, and then to think about what's the relationship between the input they're getting from the lectures and talks and various other activities, including conducting a choir, as you, yes. uh, as you know, Sue, that um, you know, we, we certainly take an unusual approach to developing leadership, and one of the opportunities you'll have is to uh, conduct a choir. Now, some of you say, what the hell has that got to do with leadership? But uh, if you think about it, of course, uh, it, it absolutely is what a conductor is doing, and we often talk about leadership as conductors, and that's a nice metaphor, a conductor of the orchestra. Well, uh, we don't just talk about it, you're going to do it, you're going to conduct a choir, and you're going to learn from whether or not you inspire those, those singers or, or not. So uh, it's from these experiences, and, and then tying those back into the, what was your leadership challenge, what does this tell you about you, what is some feedback from other people about how they've seen you do various things. So that perhaps fleshes out the the idea of what we do in the tutor groups. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think now it's probably appropriate to turn to your, um, our alumni colleagues, Laura and Kevin, um, if I may, and I will uh, ask a series of questions really uh, to reveal their own experiences of, of the program and indeed uh, their own learning about leadership as a result of being on that program. So perhaps I can start um, by asking Laura um, how you found your ideas and mental models of leadership changing um, as a result of, 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 of being in Oxford for, for that particular time. Yes, thank you, Sue. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I suppose when I was thinking about this, what struck me was the, the learning from this program has really seeped into my very DNA and what I find most is that the learning from this program actually pops out when I need it most. So it's not learning that sits in a folder on a shelf, it's within me. And what it's helped me do I think is reframe the challenge of leadership, the impact of my leadership and perhaps importantly the context in which I lead. Um, I think Goet said quite importantly about the truth being found in depth. And he said that it's much easier to recognize error than to find truth, that the former lies on the surface and the latter resides in depth, whilst this quest is not everyone's business. And I think leadership, it is our business to find depth. And this program has helped me find depth both within myself and within the evidence base that underpins it. So an example of that for me would be Gareth Morgan and thinking about the chaotic environment in which we find ourselves and being able to look at the, the influence I have in that and some of the areas that I can influence allows me to focus my energy where it really matters. I think learning about philosophy and psychology, about how we work with people, how our own humanity affects our leadership, helps us to understand the power of storytelling and sense making 
translating one culture to another, whether we're in the boardroom, whether we're in a staff meeting, whether we face a personal or professional challenge. So, so my ideas have shifted hugely, Sue, so actually. Um, whilst it's hard to articulate, I just know it and feel it. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Perhaps I can turn now to Kevin uh, and ask you, Kevin, how, how, how is it different from other programs that, that you might have been on? Oh, thank you, Sue. I've done uh, a couple of different leadership programs <clears throat> at Harvard over the years, and I was a humanities major undergrad. So most of the people in the program were senior executives who had done the case study approach to leadership and the business school case studies and breaking off into groups, analyzing cases, and coming back. I would liken that more to the, the science part of getting to leadership. Uh, and the um, OSLP is a humanities approach to leadership, which may sound very esoteric, but it's the art part of the science. And uh, to John Stokes' earlier point, um, one of the things that intrigued me about the program was getting out of my comfort zone and doing something that I wouldn't normally do, which was actually conducting the choir. And um, the gentleman who went before me actually had the uh, direction from Peter, who's the professor um, leading the, con the conductor, um, said, if, the, if you aren't inspiring the singers, they're going to sit down, <laughs> which just scared me to death. But um, we, were, we were put into a situation where we were not necessarily comfortable and not really knowing how to conduct and having the singers react to how we were moving our arms. And interestingly enough, Peter was able to tell our leadership style within about 10 to 15 seconds of watching us conduct. So that's just one example about the program that I don't think you could get anywhere else. Um, we also had Tara Swart, who's a neuroscientist, speak to us for two hours about um, health and mind and how much sleep you get, how it affects your performance. So there are many things in the program. It's, it's a full immersion for the mind, body, and soul. And it, it forces you to reflect much more deeply than I think in a case study approach that you would get in other leadership type programs or influence and power. Um, it, it does cause you to step back and deal with other people who have similar problems or issues that you can talk with them about. And um, so that's that's it in a, in, a, in a macro sense. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, Laura, let me turn to you now. Uh, why was it worth you coming all the way to Oxford? Well, I, I've had an easier journey than most. I travelled from Birmingham in the UK, so not so far. I think I chose Oxford and the business school there because the history of Oxford University and the future look of the business school really exemplifies how learning from the past can be can be explored in the here and now and taken into the future. And that, that linear timeline for me was really important. And Kevin and I have already said that we'd, we'd travel back to Oxford on, a, on an annual pilgrimage in a heartbeat. So, yeah. Thank you. And Kevin, why was it worth you coming all the way to Oxford? Well, I was partially intrigued by the history of Oxford. Um, there were several schools in the United States that had, that had other types of leadership programs, but I wasn't as interested in them. So partially it was the program itself because it was really very unique in what it offered. Uh, Peter Tofano spoke, um, who's the dean of the business school, spoke at, in Cambridge in May of last year and spent a lot of time speaking about this program and how much Oxford puts into it and how, how well thought of it is at the school. And uh, in even speaking with you, Sue, um, it really uh, settled in my mind that it was well worth it to go to Oxford uh, for the week. And um, so the atmosphere of the school and the reputation of the school and all of the different professors who participate in the program really uh, were the deciding factors for me. Great. Okay. And now I'm going to ask you both, what was your favorite session and why? Perhaps, Laura, let me start with you. Thank you. This is the uh, the question that Kevin and I both dread because we, we found it really difficult to come up with something. <laughs> I think for me, for me, there was so much. Um, we've talked a bit about um, the conducting and then that instant 360 feedback. Um, John Stokes talked earlier about adaptability, and I think the Henry V session with the Richard Olivia company was mind-blowing. But 
what, sh what struck me personally and professionally, I think, was the philosophy session with John Lennox, looking at Plato's cave. And if the swamp that John describes is largely around people and how people are behaving and feeling in, in the context in which they're working, then considering humanity and the behaviour of human beings thousands of years ago and how that still is so relevant today, that, that had a really profound impact on me. And Kevin? I have three. Uh, the, the choir part was certainly um, very important to me. I really enjoyed that, conducting the choir, but also the next day working with the choir and giving them our feedback as they were um, getting together to uh, sing different um, songs from the Tudor era. And thirdly, um, Richard Olivier's um, Henry V to Laura's point was um, exceptional. Um, on how Henry V led through the play and how Richard brought that into the 21st century and then back to Shakespeare. Um, it was it was phenomenal. Thank you. And I guess getting a, a little bit more reflective on, on you know, how the program might have changed your own leadership approach, what, what did the program do for you? And again, if I can start with Laura. Thanks. I, I've talked earlier about how the learning from that has seeped into my DNA. I think it it influences everything I do, so it's really hard to define it as a distinct developmental change. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose I suppose I'm aware of the impact it's had on me, but I'm aware through others of the impact on me in terms of my relationships with people, my personal success, the way I connect and adapt to different people and different environments. I, I see the results of that every day at work. Um, so I, I guess I guess that's I guess it's it's awoken something for me. Um, it's helped me realise the resources and skills that I already possess, but how best to deploy them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a little noise there, Sue. Did you just ask me the same question? I did. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. That's okay. Thanks. Briefly, I I have the same um, response as Laura. Um, it, it's hard to sort of pick it out, but I do think I've become more approachable as a leader, and uh, I am a better listener and thinking about what is the quality of the question being asked and taking the time to decide on the answer and not rushing into a decision. Um, I think it has caused me to slow down, step back, be a better listener, and be more approachable. And the people who work with me, above me, and for me have all commented that they have seen you know, a noticeable change in my my daily actions. Thank you. And and again, we talked about tutorials experience, both John and I, as 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 tu But what did the tutorial experience mean for you, and what did you actually gain from this this this, this approach? Uh, start with, with Laura, please. Yeah, you you talked earlier about the environment, Sue, and it, it was very safe and supported, and and being as sitting as part of the program from the first time we met. I think everyone felt very comfortable to start sharing and opening up about things they perhaps didn't, didn't realise themselves that were, were troubling them. And I think we learned a lot from each other very quickly. And I think what I'm most struck by, having kept in touch with those colleagues, is the massive impact that the programme and that group has had on them. And to see them go from success to success in such a short time following the programme is it's tremendous and actually the joy in which they talk about how they were living and working now is quite astonishing. Okay, thank you. And, and, and Kevin, same question, the tutorial experience and, and what you gained. I think the tutorial experience was really one of the highlights of um, the week. Um, to Laura's point, we, we got to know everyone in the group because you're living with them for a week, but you know the daily sessions with, I had Alan as our, our tutor and the five or six people in your group you really do get to know them on a, on a intimate level and every day we would take a, a business situation that each person faced and actually sort of analyze it and unpack it as a case and we really got to spend quality time really walking away with tangible solutions to problems that we were facing in our, in our leadership or at work and we had a follow-up call with um, Alan, I've stayed in touch with members of my group, and, and partially one of the reasons people attend a program like this beyond that is the connections you make and the people you get to meet from different cultures, 
And I do think you tend to probably stay closer to the people in your tutor group than the others because you've gotten to know them so well. And as Laura said, um, I've been in touch with everybody in my group, and it's a good, it's a support group. We email each other with questions about different business situations. So I look at it as, as a as a as a lifelong, um, you know, connection um, for business and personal. May, may I add something there, Sue? Please, of course. I think there's something about the facilitation of the group, but what we what we learned and how we learned to be in that environment that translates to the boardroom. You know, that immediate um, gaining of trust and respect with each other, being frank, being quite challenging, but in a very supportive environment very quickly, brings to my, my executive experience and the challenges of working together under pressure. So, so that's something I've also taken from it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, perhaps if I can uh, ask you a little bit about the concerns that you might have before attending the programme. Um, did you have any concerns before attending the program that, that being on the program really dispelled? Kevin, let me, let me start with you on this one. I really didn't have any huge concerns. I, I was a little nervous about the choir conducting because I was really stepping into the swamp and totally out of my comfort zone. Uh, but honestly, um, other than that, no, I, I really looked forward to it with great enthusiasm. Um, and um, no, I had no concerns. So, um, and, and Laura, what about you? Any any concerns that that, that went on here was, were dispelled? Or? I had no concerns about applying for the program because I trusted that it would be what I needed. Mm -hmm. I think the concern I had was when I received all of the information about fellow participants, and I had the the kind of self doubt of, oh my goodness, they look like proper leaders. How am I going to fit? <laughs> And, and within an hour of being on the program, I realized that we were just a bunch of human beings facing very similar challenges. So that was my only one. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. What, what would you both say to people who feel too busy to come? I mean, that's one of the things I should have said earlier, that you know, we know that leadership work is very pressured and busy and lonely, actually. But what, what would you say to people who feel too busy to come? Kevin? I would say I had the same concern. I'm glued to my iPhone. But... I don't think you can afford not to go. It is a week of time which will uh, have impact on you for the rest of your time in your career and in your personal life. It, it will also roll into that. Um, it, it's a week well worth taking the time to do. It, it's, um, it's relaxing in a sense. It's very self-reflective. I would say to people, I don't think you can afford not to do it if you're thinking about it. Just do it. Thank you. And Laura? Yeah, I agree. I think people are often too busy not to come. I think the amount of the amount of challenge and effort and heartbreak and time sat at your desk with your head in your hands not quite knowing what to do will will be saved later on. I think it will recoup back many hours in work and the return on investment for the time um, in staff welfare, productivity, achievement of your organisation makes every every hour worth it. Um, just a couple more questions now. How, how did the program make you feel lighter? I mean, what have you discarded um, in your leadership approach since the program? Kevin, perhaps I can start with you. Well, I think it goes back to um, what am I doing differently and I am more approachable. I, I do think I'm a better listener, maybe less reactionary, and, and just more thoughtful in my approach. It, it, it's, it's, in, it's in the background sort of ticking there when a situation arises, you step back and say, okay, yeah. what do I want to apply from, you know, what I took away from the program in this situation? I mean, it's certainly not, in, you'll never be perfect, but it does give you a quiver to go into and reflect and say, yes, I think this is the way to respond to that. So um, I, I think all of that has um, really, that, if that's being lighter, then yeah. yes, that's what it was. Okay. Laura? To me, it felt like taking off an old grey overcoat and, and walking into the sun. Um, I think for me, my true leadership identity emerged, which felt really freeing. Um, so it's unlocked a lot of things for me. Whilst I feel more grounded, I know I'm more courageous, I'm more sure and positive, more creative. So I feel much freer. 
Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, I think last question now. I mean, what, what was your experience, both of you, of mixing with other participants? You know, it's a very international program, people from different sectors and countries. Um, what did you learn from them? Kevin. Uh, thank you, Sue. And that is a very important part of it. I mean, I'm from the U.S. in the Northeast. We tend to run and charge pretty hard and I think would sometimes have the reputation of being more aggressive than other parts of the U.S. or, frankly, other people from Europe or Asia. And you do have a worldwide audience there. It's sort of a melting pot UN from people from all over. And you can really learn a lot about their approach to business and their styles. And as the world becomes more flat, and we, in my everyday life, I'm dealing much more with an international audience. I think being able to look back at the kids from different continents and my interaction with them helps me be more comfortable approaching people from within my company who are from different cultures and different areas. So um, that's very helpful. But the friendships that develop are um, really very important. And you do become, you're not going to become friends with everybody. You'll, you'll be you know, when you walk away, you'll probably have a handful of people you stay in touch with, and and that is the case. So um, it is very helpful. And Laura, what what was your experience of, of that uh, the, that interaction? I think a lot of what Kevin said. The culture for me was a big thing. I think recognizing that people from different organisations and countries and social backgrounds have have a different culture, a different context for them but also their own culture and how that fits. So, you know, thinking about my group, you know, someone from the Australian government, an Iranian fuel executive, and then, you know, little old me, an NHS worker from the UK. But actually the richness of it, of, of learning from each other and being alongside people facing similar challenges helped me feel much more part of an international community and made a lot of the global conversations more relevant somehow. Thank you. Um, I, th I think that's all the questions I wanted to ask you. And, it, uh, and again, just as John Stokes said when he was talking about uh, the program, you, one always learns as much from these conversations with participants about leadership. Uh, so I just wanted to, to say thank you for that. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. That was so interesting to hear your perspectives. And it, I think it, for me, as a, a listener here, it's kind of it really brings it to life actually hearing you talking about it. And you know, I work very closely with the program, but hearing how much it's changed your leadership approach and how much you got from it is, is so rewarding. So thank you both. And if you're happy to stay on the line, there might be some of the questions that are now going to come through that we could ask you as well as asking yeah. Sue. That's okay. So um, one of the questions I'll go to you first, Sue. Actually, is yeah. what good what qualities do does a good leader need or should they have? Yes. Well, um, th there are. There's the research answer and there's the kind of practical answer. I mean, there's a lot of research traits leaders should have, but, but, but again, they're the obvious things of, 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 of listening. But I think that's wrong to break it down in terms of traits. I think it is this reflection that it is very important as a leader to be reflective, both about yourself and where you come from in the spirit of what we've been talking about uh, here about these crucible moments and, and examine those as data and understand them. Um, but also uh, a capacity to explore the context in which you are leading. And by that I mean the organizational culture, the future, et cetera, et cetera. And also have a deep understanding about what your followers want. So again, if we think about that, uh, that triangle of context, leadership, and followers, it is a deep reflection on those aspects. Um, of your own situation, as well as being very attentive, not just to the future, but to the past. I'm a great believer that leadership and leaders um, need the quality of embracing the past and understanding from the past as they plan for the future. But that, happy to hear others. Thank you, Sue. That's fantastic. Kevin, if I go to you next, what's your thought on uh, qualities of, of a good leader? Uh, I echo what uh, what Sue said, and um, I think a good leader has to provide vision, has to provide um, or fix a culture that may be broken and try to fix it if it, the culture doesn't align with the goals of the company, uh, and being a good listener. Above all else, though, you have to be trustworthy and have credibility. Without those two things, you may have people who you think are following you, but they are not. So you've really got to have integrity and trustworthiness uh, in order to
be a leader and you know I, I think those are, are the two most important things a, a leader needs to have. Thank you and how about you Laura what's your thoughts on that? To build on that I think I think we as leaders need to be human and we need to role model humanity and we need to be what our troops need of us in that moment so thinking back to Henry V um, one great leader does not fit all sizes, so we need to be ready to be what we need to be when we need to be it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. And this is a question actually directly for you, Kevin, um, from one of our um, audience members. They would like to know, how do you encourage creative thinking within your organization? Well, instead of answering uh, someone who may come in with an idea or a problem, I ask them to tell me what their solution would be, whether they're sitting in my seat or um, how would they go about it and get their ideas and let them put them on the table. They then have some ownership in it and a stake in how things may turn out, but people want to be heard and they want to be valued. And I think getting people to open up and know that, you know, that there isn't a, a wrong answer necessarily and their, their ideas aren't going to be shot down, they're going to be listened to and considered. I think that gets people to open up and feel valued. Fantastic. Thank you. That's, that's a great answer. Um, and the, the next question, actually, if I can pass this yeah. to you, Sue. Mm -hmm. So um, someone, another member of our audience has asked, what's the biggest challenge facing leaders today? That's quite, <laughs> it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I also, I also asked, but I, I, the, the, the challenge um, that, 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 that I hear people talking to me about when I'm either doing research or I do quite a lot of coaching work as well, um, is really about where to, you know what what are the what are the problems that they really need to, to tackle. It's it's almost differentiating between um, you know the real challenges. What are the wicked problems? So in a way, how are you going to spend your time? And what are the problems you should be working on? And a lot of people don't spend enough time reflecting on where they're putting what what Gareth Morgan talks about is your fifteen percent. You know, discretionary fifteen percent. I think for me one of the biggest challenges is what is it that I should work on, yeah, and really understanding that, um, really understanding what is important and not being um, sort of drawn into rather mundane, operational, almost tame problems, but really taking on, you know, what I would call the wicked problems that, you know, that, that require um, perhaps a whole range of, of actions and activities but at least they are critical to the organization and critical to the human beings working in that organization and hopefully have some yield for society as well. But but nice question, but very tough. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. That's a well answered. Um, the, this is a question from Ben Kimberley, or more of an observation and a question, actually. So he's saying that company culture, emotion, behavior, leadership, feedback, that is a sort of HR pure view, and perhaps we should be aiming for business-driven HR background professionals in CEO positions to provide well-rounded interdisciplinary leaders. To what extent do you agree, Sue, with that? And um, so what's your thoughts on that, really? Yeah, so I think that's it's an interesting question. It's, 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 I think I think what that question is also getting at is the nature of, of HR, you know, in organisations. Um, so I would I would argue that um, you know it would be very interesting to to ensure that that you know human resource management really is valued uh, as a contribution to leadership. Um, so I, I think this notion of um, ensuring that very senior leaders, or all leaders, are aware of you know the importance of those very complicated but it's, it, uh, human processes that are associated with, with with HR professionals is really really important. I mean, most of the leadership work that now uh, occurs, uh, and again, I, I'll be interested in hearing my colleagues' view is around human beings, it's around influencing uh, other people. Um, so therefore the skill set that you might associate with really very good HR professionals becomes increasingly important. But I, it, Laurie, I think that might be, I mean that's sort of an area, you know, particularly in healthcare, uh, yeah. you know, that those kind of understanding the complexity of, of professionals and occupational groups. I think that HR understanding um, would be very, very important. Yeah, it is. I, th I think, you know, I can only speak from my own experience. I wonder whether a lot of human resource departments are 
challenge with doing the very difficult stuff very often, aren't they? Restructuring, you know, helping managers make very difficult decisions. And actually, helping people grow is a long, proactive, forward-thinking approach. Mm -hmm. and, and very often, it seems to be that we're living in a very reactive, fast-paced world, where if you can't see an instant hit of something, then it, it gets, you know, pushed to one side. And certainly in public sector, when, when we're very tight for resources and there's a lot of challenges about what can be cut, then how people are supported and looked after tends to come down bottom of the list. But I guess it's it's working out who, who in each organisation can role model what employees need to see to be able to grow. I mean, we know, don't we, that you know, people can't fulfil their potential if they're working in an environment of fear, for example and yet we perpetuate those environments very often. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need our senior le leaders to be vulnerable and show their fear and uncertainty and carry that doubt publicly so that they can sort of have a bit of a, mm -hmm. a leveler with the staff that they're leading. Otherwise, they leaders can, can keep themselves very remote, can't they, very sealed off from their staff um, and perhaps you know afraid of being vulnerable or seen as being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that I think certainly this program has helped us to do is to be a bit more in touch with our own vulnerability and a bit more a bit less fearful about hiding that yeah, good. Absolutely. Thank absolutely thank you um and actually we've gone to um we did have had about how can we guide so do you have an observations on that <laughs> yes um yes yeah, so 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 this is really very an interesting, I think, because you know the leadership uh, research um, really promotes uh, and, and supports the idea of emotional intelligence being a key skill of, of effective uh, effective leadership. So when we've got uh, a leader who perhaps has less emotional intelligence, um, I think the thing there to, to probably do is to um, provide this safe space for them to explore their own approach. Um, and maybe it's a coaching space. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily um, the, the sort of tutoring space I was alluding to, but I think the notion of allowing somebody to explore their self um, in a very non-confrontational and very safe way would perhaps enable them to uh, address and find you know, aspects of that emotional intelligence that are either left uncovered or they haven't seen as important. Um, so usually in this scenario, my, my, my suggestion would be very much to uh, provide some kind of reflection opportunity for them that is safe. Coaching is something that I think really, really works for that kind of challenge, uh, and I would I would really uh, uh, suggest that you, you you think a bit about that, that kind of match between a, a good coach. It's the opportunity to discover um, and to perhaps explore and understand what emotional intelligence is. It may well be that they haven't really thought about that, but it's absolutely critical uh, and, and in my judgment very true that today's leadership challenges require uh, that kind of level of emotional intelligence and reflective intelligence as well. Thank you. Um, and just Richard, I think there's a bit of a noise interference before Sue answered that question. So the question was um, yeah. for Maria is, is how can we guide a leader whose emotional intelligence is not his or her strength? And yeah. and um, as Sue said, it's um, around sort of coaching and, and and discovering that, having a safe space to be able to consider it. Um, thank you. Uh, so. Another question, probably starting with Sergio, there's a mention uh, on one of the other slides of different models of leadership based on personality types. Are you able to touch on that a little bit more? Yes, I mean, there are, gosh, there are as many um, uh, sort of models of leadership as you can imagine, but one of them is around um, the, the personality types. Um, there's a trait-based theory of, of personality. Um, and uh, John Stokes, I think, talked uh, about that being very, very important. I mean, if, if it's if it's helpful to uh, give some references, then I would ask you to look at the um, work of, of Daniel Goldman on, on on personality types, and maybe I can post some references up as, as well if that's allowed and, and thoughtful on on it. Um, but I wouldn't want us to run away with the fact that um, personal leadership really 
really begin to uh, cope, um, you know, in of themselves are the only way of looking at it. Very often, I would argue that personality-based models of leadership can complement other models of leadership. So, particularly uh, uh, models which look at the importance of context, you know, leading within a context. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and I think probably we're going to take the last question now, which I'd actually like to put to Laura, if that's OK. Um, someone has asked the question here, as, as a woman, Laura, what would you particularly say that they could get from the strategic leadership programme? Um, we're, it's something across the business school. We do a lot of work with women's networks, lots of kind of engaging with women at senior leadership. What's your take on that? Thank you. Interesting, it didn't cross my mind when I applied for the program, um, the ratio of men to women, and that's perhaps because I've worked in male-dominated leadership, so that's normal to me. There were quite a few other women on the program, and what struck me was how different they all were for me, and I had more in common with some of the men sometimes. So sex on the program it feels very irrelevant, actually, and I think anyone, however they identify their gender, would find a place. I suppose what struck me most was the female role models on the program, so thinking of everyone that I came into contact with, uh, were professional, you know, highly intelligent, warm, caring, articulate, so perhaps that's what, what I noticed the most was the role modelling during the program and then the opportunities for people who want to pursue leadership from their particular um, place. Thank you, Laura. It's really nice, and it's really refreshing to hear that you didn't actually consider that as something that you were no, no, no. concerned about. But it's really it's reassuring as well to know that you got a lot out of that, both from men and women. Um, and it's something that we we try to make sure there's a, a good mix of um, genders across the programmes. And so this probably will be the very last question now, but um, probably first to come to Sue actually. So firstly, someone saying thank you for the webinar. I'm glad you're enjoying it. That's fantastic. Um, and how could some can a little bit access oneself? And I know. The idea of kind of getting to know oneself is something that's quite key to the strategic leadership programme. Is how's that sort of um, started off? So how is that managed within the programme? Yeah, well, I think it it really starts right from from the beginning when you you, you in a sense share your own story of leadership with, with with others and you're beginning to assess yourself in relation to other styles. And I think what 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 I remember, um, you know, it's a fairly consistent theme is that whilst everybody's different in that, there's a lot of commonality of concerns and, 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 and I think that's truly kind of liberating in, in some senses. So there's that assessing, accessing oneself by looking at other people's, exploring other people's experiences and that gives you a new lens on, on you. And then, you know, the, our alumni colleagues here have talked about the range of experiences that we, in a sense, put people through, um, and largely based on the humanities, which I think awaken sort of parts of, 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 of us that we haven't really thought about or remain dormant or we've forgotten that we enjoy and, I, I, and that we're good at. Um, and I think that's that very clever blend between conversation and checking in with other people that you feel safe to check in with, um, but also this awakening of, you know, stuff inside of you that you may not have thought was, was there for a while, allows you to begin to access yourself. Um, and I hope the comments that our two colleagues have said, you know, I work on a lot of programs, but this is the one I most enjoy working on because I actually do see people access themselves and develop and discover themselves in quite a significant way, actually, and, and that gives me great pleasure as, a, as an educator. Thank I you, think Sue. Also, just Sorry. adding to that as mm. well, um, uh, the program director um, of the strate Oxford Strategic Leadership Program, Tracy Camilleri, um, really talks about this program as the self being the case study. So we talked earlier about not using traditional case studies. Kevin mentioned some of the perhaps more traditional forms of leadership training um, that he may have, um, you know, uh, experienced 
previously um, moving his, through his career, but I think it's really come out today from Sue and from um, Kevin and Laura and John, the self as a case study. And I think that what we always say to um, you know people that are really interested in in this type of development um, is that you know there is a huge investment on this program. So we talked about so many contributors already. We you know there are a, a group of amazing tutors. We have you know, um, input from you know people like we talked about Tara, Gareth Morgan, um, Richard Olivier, just to name a few. Um, and you know there is a lot of investment into this program. And I think also something Tracy would say, um, and, and a term she would use is that we really do lavish um, attention on every single person that comes on. It is um, you know a huge investment of time, um, a, a, as well as obviously the, the the cost implications. And I think that. That is something that um, really rings true from, from the discussions today. Thank you, Shane. That's fantastic. And we'll have to draw the webinar to a close now. But I thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank I think you. it's been so interesting. Thank you, Sue. And thank you, Shane. Thank you, John. And thank you to Kevin and Laura as well for their input and fantastic insights and their experience on the program. Um, we hope that you found it interesting. We hope that it's provoked some questions, some thoughts. Um, if you'd like to ask uh, Shing some questions post the webinar, her contact details are now on the screen and they will also be emailed around to all of you um, before, on Monday next week, including a recording of the webinar so you can go back and look at some of the detail and content that we've looked at today with regards to research as well as the alumni perspective and the, the session from John as well. And I'll also ask Sue for the titles of some of yes, the uh, yeah, references we'll that she mentioned. Yeah, Thank we'll you, Sue, yeah. um, including Dave, Daniel Goldman, so that you can then read up on that particular yeah, sure. area. It's really interesting. Um, so thank you again. Have a wonderful Friday evening and weekend. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again on future webinars. Thank you. Take care.